Welcome to, uh, to the event of the evening, the uh, Electron webinar. Uh, thanks so much to, for Danut, who, uh, who wants to share all of his knowledge about, uh, about Electron and, and why you should use it. Um, I'm going to do a really quick word, a short introduction about, uh, about myself and computer futures. So, uh, so my name is Caroline. I work as, a, as an IT recruiter for computer futures. Um, so if you're ever looking for new freelance opportunities, get in touch. Um, but next to the whole recruitment um, thing, um, we actually noticed as a recruiter that we talk to like so many people who do like really interesting things or who work at really interesting companies or who in their free time make like really cool and, and nice interesting apps. Um, and then we talk with them, but then the knowledge unfortunately just stays with us. So actually I think like two, three years ago, as Computer Futures, we started hosting a lot more pre-COVID. Used to be like an, an actual physical meetup. Now it's more webinars um, where we actually invite the people who, who do the really cool things to, to speak and share their knowledge. Um, and uh, I met Danut, I think it was two years ago, Danut, actually uh, within the recruitment process. But we've been in touch ever since. Um, and he told me at, at Colibra is working at Electron. Um, and it's something really cool to share, I think. So I, I invited him to come and talk. So um, I think that's my introduction. I won't bore you too much with a with an interesting computer feature sales pitch. Uh, I'm going to give you what, what you subscribe for. And that's the introduction to Electron. So uh, Danut, I'm going to give you the words uh, to do your presentation. Uh, thanks, Carlin. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Carlin said, my name is Tanut. Um, just a short uh, introduction of what's going to happen today. So I'm going to give a short presentation going over some slides about why you should use Electron, why I think it's cool, and maybe why you should uh, consider it if you ever need it. Uh, then I'm going to do a short demo. I'll try to stick it to five minutes or, or around five minutes of demo to show some quick things that you can do in Electron. You'll see the application and alongside some, uh, some code examples of, of uh, what's going on there. And uh, finally, we will have a Q&A if, if you want any clarification or such. But if you have a question in during my presentation, feel free to put it into the chat. And at the end of the demo, I will make sure that I, I will answer your question in case you don't want to wait until the end and you think you might forget. So uh, having said that, let's start it. So, oops, I moved too fast. So my name is Danut. I'm a self-taught web developer. I actually started developing desktop applications. They were kind of like cross-platform even back then when I started. Um, and then I transitioned to, to full stack development, our site in PHP. I did some Ruby, but I settled to JavaScript. I think it's uh, the most awesome thing that you can develop with and so much a uh, wide variety of choices in using it. I'm currently working as a full stack engineer at uh, Colibra, the unicorn of Belgium. Uh, where I actually mostly use Electron during my day-to-day -day job, among other things. Um, I also develop using React Native, a lot of things uh, in my day job. So I'm pretty familiar with Electron and the uh, cross-platform uh, application. A little note about myself, I'm really in love with programming and I really like playing with new technologies. I played with a lot, a lot of things uh, throughout the time. Uh, I, I like playing mostly with GraphQL, uh, with Puppeteer. For those who, who know what it is, it's the, um, it's the headless browser and you can do a lot more than just web scraping with it. Sometimes if you, if you are a bit more creative, uh, I like very much React, but I know all the other uh, major frameworks like uh, Angular and uh, Vue. Uh, I played a bit less with Vue, but uh, I'm quite familiar with that as well. And uh, I'm a very big sports fan to practice and to watch. And uh, other than that, I also like to read some uh, some books from from time to time. All right. So um, having said that, the first thing when people hear about Electron, 
they have this conception that, well, wait, is that thing which is slow? And one of my colleagues actually sent me this tweet uh, a few months ago uh, about some comparison that look, Electron is the slowest thing that you can you can work with. And uh, I actually looked over the thread and I don't know what the benchmarks were for, but I'm not gonna deny them. Yes, Electron is slow. And this talk is not about telling you that Electron is the fastest thing or the most performant thing. No, I'm trying to explain you that Electron has some benefits and in, in like all the other situation, there are some benefits where you might use something else or some drawbacks. One of the drawbacks of Electron is yes, it's slow sometimes. It's not as performant as C++ or I don't know, React Native for Windows or C Sharp, but it's doing its job. And most of the time you won't really figure out that it's it's slow. I mean, okay, in C Sharp, maybe it's gonna take 10 milliseconds. In this case, it's gonna take 70 milliseconds. Will the user notice it? Not all the time. Sometimes it might if you do some complex calculations, but yeah. So I want to say, yes, it's slow. Yes, it consumes a lot of memory because in the end it's a Chromium browser, uh, but it has its advantages. And if if you think that I'm going to try to convince you that it's not slow, that this is not uh, the point of this talk. I'm trying to convince you about uh, some other aspects. Uh, but before trying to convince you about that, I would like to to say what 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 is Electron. So Electron is a framework to build desktop application. It started, I think, in 2013 as Atom Shell. So basically, the the ones uh, some of you might remember that before VS Code there was the Atom editor, and that was the thing that GitHub built Electron for. Then it became more popular and more applications appeared like uh, Slack or Skype or Figma. You even have games on it, like uh, this kind of 2D games like Danger Crew and there are a bunch of others on Steam. And the, the, the technology is not that new actually to use HTML, CSS and JS on top of Chromium. Before Electron, there, there was another and there is still a popular framework called Chromium embedded uh, platform, which some of you might know Spotify is using it. And I think even Adobe Acrobat is, uh, is built on top of that. Uh, the advantage of Electron compared to that is that um, the Chromium embedded framework is uh, using its own APIs to interact with Chromium while uh, Electron has a much better interaction. It works natively with Chromium and it just exposes a JavaScript API. So it's much easier and it gives more um, opportunities for developers to, to, to be creative. Um, the underlying is actually written in C++ and Objective-C. Some of the components, more recent ones are, might uh, are written actually in Python. And yeah, I mean, why you should use HTML, CSS and JS? I mean, it's 2020 and uh, yeah, we should, uh, things like Cocoa and Windows Forms, yeah, they are a thing which maybe they are for 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 the past decade, uh, and I think I think it's 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 a much better opportunity to to use the 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 web platform to develop applications. I mean, you can even develop using Windows Form a native application and uh, using Xamarin, for instance. Okay, so what's the act? architecture of Electron. So as I said, um, Electron is based on Chromium. It's actually having an embedded Chromium inside of it. And all the APIs that are available in Chromium are available in Electron. So whatever you see in, in the Chrome browser, probably it's possible to be done in Electron as well. We have to make a small distinction that Chromium is not equal to Chrome most of the time, though there is there are very slight differences, but there might be certain things which are not on par. Um, but the architecture is very simple. If anybody worked with desktop application before, uh, it works on the IPC system. What does IPC, IPC means? It means inter-process communication. In the case of Electron, the IPC sticks only to its own processes. It cannot 
usually communicate with other applications as the IPC protocol can do that actually. It's because of some implementation uh, complications that would require more native code written for uh, Objective-C or for C-sharp. So that's why you only have IPC communication between you have, you see, you have a main process, which is actually a node process. And then you have renderer processes, which are basically browser windows. And you use this IPC layer to, to communicate between the, the two processes. A render process basically can, can it's, it's a browser window, as I said. So you can run multiple applications in different uh, render processes. It's kind of like you have like some multi-threading, you could call it. Uh, but of course, you shouldn't abuse that because uh, if all the communication between those render processes has to go through the main process. And being a node process, you have to, to, to keep in mind that it is single threaded in the end. So some examples of just copied from the from the Electron documentation about how the IPC communication works. Uh, please, we are in 2020, use asynchronous communication just to make uh, JavaScript a bit more uh, performant instead of using synchronous messages, which would uh, clog a bit um, your main process if, if you do that. So you see we have a typical event-based programming, which is very common nowadays. If you, if you did any serverless, it should come very, very easily to understand that yeah, you send a message on one side and you uh, and you listen for it on the other side, and maybe you can even uh, reply to it as you can see. Um, there is also in the newer versions of Electron, uh, they um, they made it possible to use a sync await. Uh, it uses a bit of a different syntax. You have on the main side you have the handle keyword instead of the on. Uh, and on the um, on the renderer side, you have the invoke instead of the send method. Uh, okay, so now why you should be using it? Well, it uses web technologies, as I said, uh, but it still gives a native feel. Not everything feels native. That's one important thing, but a lot of the things still feel like they are native. And you already know web technologies, most of you. So you can leverage and build um, an, a desktop application extremely fast. And it's not only for prototyping, but rather keeping applications in productions. There are so many apps in production that uh, they are so good uh, in terms of performance. Like if we take, for instance, Discord. Discord is way much better than uh, uh, than Slack in terms of implementation, they they optimized very well, and it's a, it's an Electron application. Even uh, even like VS Code is is not a bad editor. Okay, it's not Sublime Text, it's not as snappy, but it still does uh, perform very well. Depending on how many, of course, uh, plugins you have installed. And I really like this tweet from um, from this guy from Infinite Thread when it says, okay. Uh, the native app memory usage of uh, of an application is zero because you never ship it. Yes, I know Electron uses quite a lot of memory, but it's actually something that we have to keep in mind. Like Chrome actually uses this uh, a lot of memory in general because they focus very much on offering 60 frames per second when you are in the application. So when you scroll or you navigate or something, they don't, uh, Chrome doesn't want to give the user the impression that it's it's not snappy, that uh, the, the scroll is freezing or stuff like that. And so it consumes a bit more memory to, to give this very smooth experience, which is in the end, it's not a bad thing. I mean, it's 2020 and most of the, of, of the computers have quite a decent amount of memory. Okay, not everybody has 16 gigs or 32 gigs, but it's quite common to have like eight gigs of RAM. And yeah, I mean, even my phone has kind of a similar amount of memory. Um, the second thing is like, yes, it's cross-platform. You can uh, write one single code base and it will be available for Windows, Mac OS, and uh, Linux. 
as I said, you can very fast prototype. You can not only reuse the code for a plat cross-platform thing, but you can also use this code to have a web version of it. Like if you look at Slack, for instance, the application looks the same on the web as it looks in the desktop. Uh, and the amount of code reuse that it can go very, very high. Um, you have quite low level accessibility. You have a lot of APIs that are available in Chrome that can can help you do a lot, a lot of things. Uh, but if, if there is something that you think that it's possible, in theory, it's kind of possible. The only thing which works very hard, it's if you want to, to work with Active Directory. There, it's, it's very tricky because uh, the APIs change quite a lot. It's, it's a very familiar developer experience. You have the, the developer tools that you are uh, so, uh, so familiar with. Uh, you have HTML, you have CSS, you have uh, JavaScript. There is a huge community and this is a very important thing and an ecosystem of, of packages. You see, I have a screenshot that I, I just searched last week on NPM, how many Electron packages are. They are around 4K. Uh, it's not a big number but it's not a, a low number either. It's, there are enough packages to, to cover most of the use cases that you can, uh, you can think of. Somebody, let's say, more experienced uh, than, than us on one particular system came up with a package to, to do something in Electron. And it's very, very important. A huge community means also that if you have an issue, you can find an answer. And, there are a lot of GitHub issues and Stack Overflow answers uh, that clarify a lot, a lot of things. I seldom had a question which didn't have an answer somewhere about Electron. It is actively maintained. They release kind of like every three, four months until I think two years ago, they were releasing like very infrequently. But since 2019, they jumped from version three, I think to version 11, which was just released. Um, the Chrome version that it's using is almost up to date. Like actually the latest version of Chrome, it's using, uh, it's 87 and it's the same version in, in Electron. And the docs of Electron, it's, it's, it's very good. It's like, I wouldn't recommend another place if you, if you want to know something about Electron. It's not as good as the Vue.js documentation, but it's, it's quite close given the fact that it's quite quite broad. Um, what are some of the out of the box features? So we have notifications, extremely easy to work with them. You can work with the file system. You can create a tray icon and some tray actions. You have native file drag and drop. Uh, there's taskbar and doc uh, APIs. Uh, you can register a keyboard shortcut, but this, it's, uh, I would put it as a, a bit of, uh, if you are used to Mac OS, for instance, you know that uh, the keyboard shortcut can be registered as some sort of a service. So when you press that shortcut, it's gonna open the app as well, which this thing is not really possible in Electron. Uh, it, it only registered the shortcut when the application is, is loaded. If you ever need this kind of behavior, you would need to write some, uh, some objective C or some Swift code to, to tackle it because uh, the community won't do anything about it. They, they were very clear that this is one of the things that they won't tackle because it's very specific to, to macOS. Um, you can get the application progress, like for instance, when copying files, you know, you can, you can show, uh, you can show progress. You can show the recent documents that were opened with the application and you can provide auto update. It, it is a separate package, but uh, it works extremely easy. So I was speaking about the familiar developer experience. You see, we have the developer tools here and everything um, is, is something that we all know how to work with. And uh, we use our favorite IDE and we write JavaScript, which looks very, very simple. I would say it's just functions and some event-based programming. Um, if you want to get started, if you want to get started, you can just write an, a main.js file and an index.html and it will just work. But if you want something a bit more um, 
complex than that. If you want to use like a, maybe like a web framework or something like React or Vue or Angular, uh, I would suggest using one of the boiler plates or uh, starter packages. Uh, the first one that I would suggest is Electron Forge. Uh, it's actually, I think, made by Slack. And it's, it's quite a good uh, package. It provides a lot of templates and uh, it also handles like parts of the auto update, um, code signing part. Um, and they also do a lot of optimization around uh, the size of the application. If, if this is something which is important uh, for you when you develop. Uh, on the other hand, there is the Electron Webpack. It's pretty similar to Electron Forge in the sense that it gives like some templates for TypeScript, for React, some uh, things like this, but it doesn't handle parts like uh, auto update, code signing, uh, building the application. Uh, for that, uh, the same guys that made Electron Webpack, uh, they provide this separate uh, module called Electron Builder. And this is, this is a very good module. I use it all the time. Uh, it helps you build very easily the application. Uh, it can help you with the uh, updates. It can help you with the release uh, platform. It's it's very it's very good. And I also put a I would say a personal um, favorite of mine, and it's uh, Electron React TypeScript Boilerplate. Um, even though it says React. It's actually a bunch of Webpack files and some boilerplate of Electron that uh, if you know Webpack, you can make it work with anything that you want. And it's in the, that gives a lot, a lot of power of how, what things you can do there. And I, I really like it and it's very easy to, to use. It also in, it uses Electron Builder and uh, it installs a lot of goodies as well, like uh, the dev tools. For instance, if you wanna develop in React, you. Uh, this uh, this boilerplate installs Redux DevTools and the React DevTools. Um, I'm giving here an an example of how easy it is to to prepare something to be uh, built, like an installer. For instance, we see we have in package.json how the app it's called. Uh, what do we want for the Mac, for instance, uh, to to happen? What do we want for Linux, we want a, a Debian package. And for Windows, we want an NSS installer. And we have, of course, like some um, special things that we can do, for instance, for, for the Windows installer, we want it to install in program files. Uh, and we don't want to be like a one-click installer. And so on there, are, I would suggest using uh, the documentation of Electron Builder. It's very, very complete and it gives a lot, a, a lot of possibilities. And as well, you see, I also have a published part that I'm uh, using GitHub, as a matter of fact, to, um, to host my, my installers uh, there. Now, some practical things. Um, say you want to have these badges that Slack uses, how many messages and uh, uh, for a notification you have. It's very, very easy. You see, you just, but this is only a Mac thing. You see, I set app badge count as four, and then it's showed there. If I want to show the dot, I just set the badge to be a dot. If I want to work with the tray, um, you see the, the code is very easy. I just uh, I just set the icon that I want it. Uh, and then uh, I set a context menu for it. And on click, I can see uh, the, uh, the browser window, for instance, if I, if I click on the, on the tray icon. It's, yeah, I mean, five lines of code to, to create a tray, it's, it's quite okay. Okay, there are a bit more uh, lines of code to actually create the context menu, but okay, I, I think it's quite doable compared to writing it natively. Um, notification, extremely easy. Just import it from Electron, give it a title, and yeah, just display it. Um, the notifications are pretty basic, but if you want more complex notifications, there are NPM packages created by Slack uh, that handle this this kind of uh, like you can reply to notifications, you can customize a bit more the icon, for instance. Uh, so 
I, I mentioned some of the packages actually later on in the section to for the notification. One thing which in all my developer jobs was like, can I have this exported as PDF? And every time I heard that, it's like, yeah, just shoot me in the head. I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, it's complex. It's hard. It doesn't work. Well, in Chrome, you can actually print to PDF. So it means that you can do that in Electron. And I think I have here like 15 lines of code or something like that, that shows how easy it is to print to PDF. Uh, basically, the first lines refer to the fact that I create a, um, a dialog box asking, where do you want to save it? it? It's a native dialog box. And based after that, I just create uh, a file using the buffer. And uh, that's it. It's really, really easy. Um, OK. If you want to work with Windows 10 um, APIs, you can interact actually with all the UWP APIs um, using NodeRT. NodeRT, it's, it's a package that is not only for Electron, actually, it's uh, available to you to be used in Node, of course, as well, uh, created by Slack too. And you can actually interact with all these uh, Windows 10 APIs. Like you check the, the documentation, what are all these APIs, and you have a promise based um, API uh, using NodeRT. Uh, it's sometimes, it's a library which is run, running a bit under the radar, but if you manage to understand what's happening on the, on the side of the C sharp part, like you check the C sharp or the C. Uh, code examples, uh, then you can uh, easily convert uh, to to some promise-based uh, calls using NodeRT. It's not that easy. There are not that many examples in that library, but you can make some stuff. You can actually make the the authentication to work with uh, with Active Directory to get the Windows users if you need it using that. Otherwise. It, it's a bit harder if you just rely on, on Electron. Regarding macOS APIs, uh, unfortunately, there's no package that I'm aware of. I know there is a package that, that's very old from the very beginning of Node to, to interact, to make calls directly to Objective-C, uh, but um, there is no good, good um, Node library that I'm aware of that that would call like Cocoa APIs or I don't know, uh, something that would interact with the, with the APIs available on the Mac system. So unfortunately on this side, I think Windows won it. Um, some tips I think which are very important is like to watch out for garbage collection of your variables in the main process. If you declare your variable in the wrong place, like inside of an event or something, uh, you, it will be garbage collected because, of course, it's JavaScript, so it tries to optimize the memory usage. So sometimes it might garbage collect your your variables. So make sure that you put them as top variables, um, global variables, so that you can uh, you can use them and use them in different functions. Uh, one very important thing is to watch out for memory leaks in the render process because. You can subscribe to an event, but also make sure that you unsubscribe to, to, to an event. It's a bit like Angular. You need to watch out that you subscribe to an observable and you also unsubscribe to it when you don't need it. Otherwise, you might see that the memory spikes up and it's not Electron's fault. It's more uh, the developer's fault. One important thing is to mention is the code signing process. This is uh, this is very important. It makes sure that uh, the the application uh, is not tempered by anyone else besides the developer. Uh, on Windows, it's not mandatory, but if you want to put it in production, nobody will use it unless it's code signed. Everybody would, would say, yeah, but I would like the application to be code signed. Uh, on Mac OS, you, you cannot bypass it. Like uh, the system won't like it. Uh, you can actually make an installer of it, but it will not auto-update because it's not code signed. 
uh, you would need a code signing certificate for a Mac by making an Apple Apple developer account and figure out which uh, certificates you need to export. It's very well documented in, uh, in the Electron documentation what certificates exactly you need. Uh, for Windows, it's actually even more expensive to get a, um, a, a code certificate. I think it's, uh, but it's, it's, it's for a longer period because for the Apple developer account, you pay per year while, while for a Windows certificate, I think you pay every three years or something. Um, make sure that if you have, uh, if you do auto update to your app, you disable this feature for the store builds like for Mac store or for Microsoft store, do not include an auto update. It will blow up in errors when the, when the user will start it. it it won't, the application would still work, but uh, it will be, a, I would call it an, a nasty experience. It is very important to add a product name to the root of your package.json. And this, this actually is very useful if you have uh, multiple words in, uh, in your product name, because normally in package.json, the name of the application cannot have spaces. So in your, in the installation folder will, will not have spaces and will look weird. So, or even camel case or stuff like that. But if you do a pro, if you add a product name, then you can add spaces and it will be nicely uh, formatted. If you don't want to use like node RT, for instance, for authentication, I would suggest to use like to register a custom protocol in Electron. Uh, maybe some of you use Slack and you saw that when you open Slack and you want to log in, it actually opens a browser window, which at the beginning I thought that's really weird. Why would they do that? Well, they want you to, to authenticate in the browser and based on that authentication, they send you a session using the protocol. And that's one way in which you can handle like more complex authentication if you don't want to go the native way. So you can handle like Active Directory or uh, stuff like this. Um, if you want to reduce memory usage, it's good that you don't display thousands of items of uh, DOM nodes and use uh, virtualized lists. And um, for security reasons, you can, but you shouldn't run like, just because it's a node process, the main process, doesn't mean that you should run an express server um, inside Electron. I, I tried once and it worked fine, but it's very hard to debug. And for security reasons, anybody can access your ports and uh, start doing uh, nasty stuff. Uh, if you want to release it and publish it somewhere, I would say you can use GitHub to host your releases as long as it's a public repo, of course, and use GitHub Actions. I cannot really stress how good GitHub Actions actually is. Um, it's, it supports Mac OS platform, it supports Windows, it supports uh, Linux, which I don't think an any other SaaS platform does, like Circle CI doesn't for sure, um, or Travis. Uh, it misses one of the operating systems. So here you have all three of them. You see it's just a YAML file, extremely easy to, to set it up. And you just have uh, an installer somewhere hosted on GitHub. If you wanna build it locally, you can build it for the platform that you are, uh, that the computer is using or inside the VM. Though sometimes some of the installers you can uh, run, like for instance, from Mac, you can build for Linux and Windows as well, but you cannot build for uh, Microsoft Store, for instance. Same thing for Windows, you cannot build for Mac Store. You can build a Mac installer like a DMG, uh, but you cannot build uh, like a Mac Store installer. So sometimes it's, it's just better to, to, to use like a SaaS platform to, to do that. Um, okay, security. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a browser application. So whatever, whatever security issue is on the browser, it's in Electron as well. And the most obvious one is are the XXS attacks. Uh, especially for chat applications, like all the time sanitize the, 
the inputs that are coming there because you can do any kind of nasty stuff in there. Um, a lot of the NPM modules are actually using remote module. So you can run what you can do in the main process. You can actually do in the render process using this remote module, which uh, lately it's highly discouraged by Electron. And a lot of the libraries are trying to, to move away from it as well. And uh, it's, it also affects your performance from time to time if you if you abuse it because it creates a lot of events behind the scene of IPC communication behind the scene. Um, I would say session and navigation permission are also very important. So restrict the application to navigate wherever. This would also prevent some XXS attacks. Like for instance, somebody tries to make the application to go on different domains or stuff like this or to run uh, uh, different uh, microphone permissions or stuff like that. You can do that in the main process by blocking some of the things. Um, some of the more useful libraries that you can uh, uh, use alongside Electron are Electron Log. It's very good to have logs. It's easy to debug. Uh, you can use that in the main process and in the renderer process. Um, Electron store or Electron JSON storage, they are very similar, especially if you want to pre-configure the app, for instance, or you want to uh, save some value. Um, you can do that, of course, in local storage, but it won't be available uh, in the main process easily when creating the, the browser window. So for instance, uh, I don't know, you want to remember the last time, uh, the last uh, size of the application. Uh, you do that, you save it into a file. The next time when you open it, it's read from that file and you have it available. Or uh, I don't know, a global shortcut, for instance. Um, Electron context menu. Electron doesn't provide a native context menu, unfortunately, but somebody came up with a, with a, with a good solution. It's a good NPM package and is very, very, very good. Uh, low DB, it's, it's from the guy who made JSON web server. It's a JSON like database. It's very, very good and much easier to use than uh, if you want to use, for instance, SQLite, you can do that. The demo, you'll see that it's using SQLite, but of course, sometimes you have to handle uh, the annoying part of like running uh, native code with node gip and stuff like that with low DB, you don't have this problem. Um, Spectron is an end-to-end -end test um, framework for Electron. It's very, very good and very, very easy to use. Electron Notarize, it's extremely important, especially if you do Mac development, because they, the application, when it installs, it will show that it's not trusted by, by the operating system uh, if it's not notarized. Uh, by using this package, it's extremely easy to lines of code and uh, it uploads the application to, to the Apple servers. They do their stuff for five minutes and then they say, yeah, that's fine. Uh, for um, bug, bug tracing, I would suggest using Sentry. They have a fantastic documentation and a fantastic library, uh, but check a bit. Uh, with the legal side of the company because sometimes they might store some PII and you would need to hide them in, uh, in Sentry. Um, Electron DevTools installers, as I mentioned it before, um, it's very good. You have the Dev... For instance, in Electron, you cannot install like any kind of um, Chrome uh, plugins that you can think of. You can only install the DevTool plugins, like, uh, I don't know, a Polo DevTools, uh, View DevTools, and so on. And some of the DevTools are uh, are included in this Electron DevTools installer. Uh, instead of like downloading yourself the uh, the plugin and pointing Electron to to the installation, it just picks it up automatically. And then you have from Slack this Electron Windows notification that it's. Uh, it's a more comprehensive way of handling notification. You can reply to notification, you can change the icons and uh, so on and so forth. Um, okay, enough with the talk. And uh, let's, do, let's do some bit of a demo. Um, okay, let's see. So we have this application. It's, it's a very basic application. It has 
uh, a backend somewhere and it shows a list of books. You can uh, search by uh, title and uh, doesn't do much. Uh, you can create a book. And uh, one of the features that I wanna show is like, as I said, to export to PDF. So I export, you see, I have a native, this is a native save dialogue. I can save to say, I don't know, somewhere else. Uh, I press save and uh, this is a notification handled in my application. But if I press uh, okay, open, it opens the PDF. You see, it looks almost the same without the sidebar because I don't want the sidebar in the, um, in the PDF. Um, one advice that I have is like, don't go crazy on the, on the layout because it, it works very well, the export to PDF, but it doesn't support from my experience CSS grid. If you use uh, Flexbox, it works fine, but sometimes with, uh, especially with pagination, you will have a lot of issues with CSS grid if you use um, PDF. One thing which I wanted actually to show is that we can actually use this application offline. So if I go to network and I put it as offline, I can still, you see that it does some GraphQL queries, right? But I can still search, let's look for another book. Well, seems like it didn't search. Let's try to put it online again. Okay, good. It saved everything. Hopefully, let's see if I search. Well, it seems that my feature embarrassing Embar in an embarrassing way doesn't work, but I'll try to at least um, create an author, for instance, and sync it uh, with with the backend. So I'll create uh, I don't know what that or it doesn't come anything in mind. I'll say Arthur C. Clark. I'm offline. Uh, it shows up here, but you see that the network calls are blocked because I'm offline. But if I put it online, then you see that all these calls are there. And if I refresh the application, it comes as well. So let's look a bit around the code. So this is the main process. I hope it's big enough to phone that everybody sees it. Um, so the first thing is that you create this window. It's it's a browser window, as you see, you define the size and you have, if you use like, I use React actually to, to build this application and you have multiple ways of handling like routes because uh, I'm running the export um, inside a separate browser window. So I want, for instance, to connect to a specific route. Um, there are a few options. I would say the easiest is to use hash routes uh, because then you can go directly there and it's picked by the application. Or another option is to use this um, preload function um, of, the, of the browser window. And you see here, when I run this, it would send me to a different uh, location. Then we have the, the tray you see here. So I have the application, I have the tray here. And you see if I, for instance, if I have it hidden and I click on it, the application shows up uh, and I have this nice menu. Uh, you can have icons exactly like the one from Docker, for instance, uh, just by providing an, a black and white image and then they will make sure that it works with the dark mode or with the light mode, but this is only a Mac feature. It, it doesn't work like that on, on Windows. So if I go to the tray, you'll see that I have the a context menu, which does, if it's Windows, I show a notification. If it's uh, Mac OS or Linux, then I show a different kind of notifications. For instance, here I run an auto update, for instance. Um, you see the tooltip, the one that you see here. So if I hover, it should show up, but the app is open, so it should be here. Uh, then I set the context menu, and when I click, I show the, the window. 
Then for the auto update, one thing which I cannot demonstrate because it will take too much time is that this is very much a copy paste from the documentation. You see, you have all these events uh, that uh, to handle the auto update, but the only thing which you should care, it's actually this function to check and to start the, the download automatically. There's nothing fancy, that's it to, to make it work. And of course uh, you need in package.json uh, somewhere to, to host it. You see here, I'm hosting on GitHub on the, and the type of uh, release type, it's a release so that they don't create a draft release. You can host on S3 as well. Everything works out of the box. Um, maybe some of the features about uh, how do I do the part of like, when it's offline, I intercept the call. So let's try the network status. And you see here when there is a default session and what, before sending a request, I check uh, because it's a GraphQL, they are all post and I check the network status. Uh, remember that I said that the, um, for garbage collection to have global variables. So this one is declared outside of my function to, to make sure that it's available all the time. Um, you see, I check if it's offline and then I decode the buffer and uh, I save the data in uh, index uh, DB actually. I also use some logic for uh, handling um, like this part because you can see, I, they still see, but I, can, I cannot search for them. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't work, uh, but this come from an SQL uh, light database. And uh, this queries happen, this is the delete part when it comes online, but you see here, I fetch everything, see, and I put, so very, very easy, uh, extremely useful and uh, quite easy to, to do. Um, regarding the export, uh, let's go a bit over it quickly. Uh, you see, I'm creating actually a different browser window, as I said. Uh, again, I'm using the hatch because it's easier. I'm sending some uh, the data because again, the, the browser windows are sandbox, so they do not communicate. They need to go to the main process. So I'm receiving some data from from the other from the main browser window, and I'm sending it to the uh, export. You see it here, and then based on when they render the page, I show the dialog. I create the file, I close it, and I show the notification. Uh, I would suggest that uh, you check the repo. It's uh, I I put it at the end of the of the demo. Uh, to have a look at the features, but there are many, many more features in uh, in Electron than uh, than the ones that I covered. And actually, before doing, after I did this, I actually wanted to try um, to run it in the browser. And um, I have the app in the browser. So same application. If I check the authors, I should have Arthur C. Clarke as well here. So you see the the app runs the same as in Electron. Uh, I have the code here. This one I didn't include it because it's a bit more complex. It's a Create React app. And I had to change a lot of settings there to, to make it work because I had some Webpack aliases. Uh, but if we compare uh, the folder structure that we have here in Render, you'd see that it's almost the same. The only thing which is different is the, is the, I would call the containers, like the ones that make the queries because there is some electron logic uh, inside here. You could see that for instance, in books, I have this uh, offline search capability, which uses some electron functions, uh, which they shouldn't be in, uh, in the browser version, uh, but other than that, it's the same code base. So I think that's uh, 
that's a pretty powerful thing. You can have a, a web version and a desktop version with pretty much uh, minimal code changes. And that's kind of about it. Uh, thank you very much for bearing with me uh, so far. Um, I hope you found out something and I made something clear about Electron and uh, I would be more than happy to answer any of your questions if you have any. No questions? There are questions in the chat. I don't uh, wait. Sorry, I don't see the oh yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh yes. So um is the demo source code available for attendees? Yes, um it's actually here. Uh so the presentation is available. Carlene, uh, I sent to Carlin the presentation so you can go over it. Uh, the code is available in GitHub uh, under my name, Electron Bookshelf. Uh, you can check the code there. Um, I would suggest to fork it if you wanna play more with it and to deploy so that you don't deploy over my own deployments. Um, the offline sync feature was done by you or provided by a library. The offline sync feature is done by me. Uh, that's that's a thing that I did it myself. Um, I actually used two types of offline sync, I would say, uh, which one which I tried to demo but half worked, which is using SQLite and one which is using IndexedDB. So you have multiple options. Uh, in theory, you should go for one of them, not both like I did, but I did it only for the demo purposes. Um, you can find in the code base um, how it works. I would say, yeah, the easiest is to go with uh, index DB or like low DB. Uh, the index DB means mm -hmm. you don't need to install any other package, but then you need to pay attention because it's a key value uh, browser window. So if they refresh something, they you might lose the data if they manage to, if they decide to clear the cache or something. Um, so yeah, low DB, it's a, it's a good option. SQLite, it's, it's also very good, but sometimes it's hard to install and annoying, but once you get it running, it, it works fine. Uh, how hard is to convert an existing web app to Electron? Uh, that very much depends. I know that this is a silly answer, but um, normally depends how, how much you want to leverage from Electron side. Because if you have the, the existing web app, you can just load it in the browser window and it will work. If you are fine with that and you don't want any other features from Electron, then it's almost uh, no work involved, just copy pasting or well, you can even load because actually, um, here you see I'm loading a new URL. You can actually load a remote URL. So you can load your own app, uh, web app, like the deployed version of it. I wouldn't suggest do that, but you can do that. So. If you want the easiest option, you can do that. Um, yeah. If you want to, to involve some more Electron stuff, then it requires a bit of, I would say, thinking. Because if you want to reuse the code in both sides, uh, you need to make sure that you have a bit of a separation of concerns. Like certain things uh, that involve Electron are wrapping the things that are uh, non-electron based. Like I can give you an example here. It's it's a React app, uh, but you see, I have this network status provider, which is very specific to 
to electron it involves electron stuff for the offline thing i have this electron network status and i make sure that in my application you see that these two are uh, missing same thing is like if i go to uh, books i have this offline search capability and so on this function that i pass uh, to to call this um, offline capabilities well if i check here um, i'm using the same function actually but this argument is optional so without it the application still works but yes if you check the offline it, it involves some uh, some uh, electron logic uh, you could pass a different function in this use case to to do something in the browser for instance um yes how do you i saw you use like a front front end framework react yes um how do you communicate with electron is it also with the the ipc bridge so starting with how it works so we have webpack right that's mm -hmm. not nothing too fancy you see i have a babel loader and uh, a bubble rc somewhere i should have right so mm -hmm. that does the react part um the communication between react and uh, electron don't think about it in terms of like i use react or i use angular or i use something it's just code react normally or angular or whatever and make sure that when you want to do something you just have a method that calls some electron apps i can show maybe let's say uh, the network status let's say because you see here i have a use effect which is basically a component did mount i think in angular and something uh, similar in Vue. Uh, mm -hmm. when something changes basically i'm sending something to to the main process that's how i communicate yeah. and you see when i instantiate the component i'm starting to listen to an event coming from the from the main process and when i unmount the component in order to avoid the memory leaks i um, i remove the event listener yeah. if it's if it's like at the root of your uh of your application something like this like the topmost component you don't really need to uh, to remove the event listener because normally you would just close the application most of the time so you won't have problems but if you have something more nested i i highly suggest to to use some sort of component did mount or like when the component is no longer there to remove the event listener because otherwise it, it will easily spike up your uh, your memory usage no huh? uh, for, uh... you're welcome you're welcome <laughs> can you recommend a good uh, a good uh, boilerplate yes so this is what i was talking about here mm, where is it any of these are good boilerplates uh, i actually use this so the repo that uh, you saw it's using this um, i use a slightly modified version i have a pr open from a very long time to to this repo to have a hot module reloading on the main process so basically um, okay it's you have webpack dev server so if i change something on the on the front end part let's call it it's going to reload but out of the box it won't reload electron so i can demonstrate that this works now um, by doing this okay so this is a security thing you see i i, I said that um, you should prevent people to navigate to random parts because i can do this actually uh, where's the application so somehow if you don't uh, sanitize your things you can do this uh, wait so 
I need to remove this. It's reloaded. Okay. And it moved to the other screen. Okay. So if I do this now, you see that I'm on Google, which is maybe acceptable, but from sometimes it, it might not be okay. So I would suggest you prevent this kind of stuff. Now, coming back to the question of the boilerplate, um, I would say if you want the easiest, easiest thing and never care about Webpack or anything, start with Electron Forge. You have everything there, uh, code signing, uh, publishing, uh, boilerplate for TypeScript, boilerplate for, uh, for React, boilerplate for Vue. Um, that's a very good one. Um, if you want something that you want to mess up with yourself, I would suggest using this one um, because you have all these Webpack files. And if you want to do something fancy, I know there are a bunch of Webpack files and it's sometimes annoying to work with them, uh, but you can change everything. You, if you want to use a different loader, if you want to, you, of course, it doesn't mean that this package doesn't allow you to extend, but it's sometimes more, uh, more difficult. So I would say either go with this one or going with this one. Uh, these two, you would need to use them in conjunction because this one, it's only for the development part. But if you want to create an installer, you would need this one. This one is like, let's call it like uh, the Create React app of Electron. It does everything for you. And this one is a combination of everything like these two together somehow. And uh, you still can tinker with it yourself if you want. If I can ask another question. Sure, um, be my guest. <laughs> I saw you. Um, showed some installers like NCIS. Yes. But, um, do you have any recommendations for that? Because I was looking into like um, Electron Builder, that one. Yes. It had some like, uh, you could say for, for default installers, but is it easy to get a custom installer and to maybe add like resources or extra steps or define some other way of packaging? I saw uh, that you could do like NCIS scripts, but it's like a really old language, it seems. Yes, it's true. It's a, it's a, so um, the one that I showed you, the, so the, the thing that you see here in package.json, it's actually using uh, Electron Builder as well, as you said. Um, you, can prov uh, you can provide other things than NCS NCSS. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know them by heart, uh, but there are some, let's say, more modern ones. Uh, other than that, um, the thing you is, have, you uh, can also customize the N NCSS. You have some hooks, no. so if you want to do like you, you can easily like change the, um, um, for instance, the icon or whatever. But in my case, for uh, for the company that I'm working, I actually changed. Uh, the whole installation process. Well, not really the whole installation process. The installation is still, I would like Electron Builder to do it for me, to not care about it. Mm -hmm. But I, I added some extra functionality, like it creates um, like a file with some pre-configurations and stuff like this for, for silent install. But normally inside here, let's see Windows, there should be more options other than not code signing. Multi-platform uh, build. What yes. do you use, like, uh, to do that kind of logic, or extra things? Uh, the extra things. So, um, okay. To answer to your question, let's see where is the NCIS. Uh, ah, but you use NCIS and then add. Yes. Like the, so, uh, uh, Electron Builder provides you also like um, some hooks during yeah, the yeah. installation process that you can write custom code, and inside that hooks. I, I wrote uh, some very basic NCS, uh, NCI, if, whatever code I wrote there, it, but it's oh. really basic. It's, it's not something 
uh, crazy or something like that. I just create a file somehow and I use some variables and something like that. Because it's true that the language is, is very basic and you and you even can't declare too many variables. You can only declare 20 variables that are kind of like uh, standard as well. Oh. Yes, no. so so there are certain limitations. It's not that the language doesn't allow you, but the hook itself doesn't allow you because uh, you write this hook, so you cannot declare like global variables. Everything is kind of like scoped, so you can only use the already declared variables. So it's it's a bit of a mini trade-off, but you, uh, I would say you can uh, you can work with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but. I um, I don't find exactly what installers you can, because you can have other than NCSS. You can also like uh, have APPX for, uh, for Windows. That's the Microsoft mm -hmm. Store installer. Oh. You just have to say here, uh, I want target APPX and that's it. And I think you can have MSI or something, but I'm not sure because I, I usually stick to this and to AP. APPX, and then I upload it to to the Microsoft Store. Oh, oh. And do you use any auto updating or like? Yes, yes, I I use auto update. Uh, in this example, it's using uh, GitHub, but actually, for uh, for the company, we are using S3. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's almost the same as you just say here S3. You put the bucket the region and if you want like a custom folder and that's it. You don't yeah. have to do anything else. Of course, uh, keep in mind, you need this uh, auto updater uh, code, no, no. this no. one. As long as you have something inside here, like a bucket or a GitHub uh, page, it will know where to look for. Yeah, and does it only do like the, uh... A, a small context or does it do the whole application? Uh, the whole application. So it works a bit like uh, if you're using VS Code, now the, you know that you don't have to restart the application, uh, but uh, before you had to restart. When you had a new application, you had to restart the application. Mm -hmm. That's how the auto update works. You can do no. a bit more fancy stuff, but it's it's a bit more complicated out of the box. Uh, you need to restart the application to to apply the update. And um, do I have somewhere? Because I think I have the command. Um, let's see. I don't think I have. There there is a command to like basically restart the app and apply the update. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the only thing which sometimes it's annoying, to be honest, is like if, for instance, somebody starts the application, it starts downloading the, the update and they close it. Uh, they close the computer mm -hmm. or they close the app. Basically, it cuts off uh, the update, uh, the update download. So it's going to start next time. It's going to start again downloading it. And somewhere in the background, mm -hmm. it will throw an error. You won't, the user won't see it, but if you have like some, I don't know, uh, tracing or something, you might see that it throws an error that a temporary file is no longer there or something like that. But it's not something that you should worry about. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. But uh, yes, uh, what I said before, it's like pay attention that if you uh, published to to the to the platform stores like Mac or Microsoft, to not mm -hmm. to not enable auto update, because the uh, the updates are then handled by the by the store, so you won't need this feature. Mm -hmm. And it no. will even like start yeah. Uh, yeah. the application will start like showing an ugly message saying, "Oh no, you don't need this" and stuff like that, uh, which. Would the app would still work, but the first time that the user sees that, it would be oh, what's this? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, maybe ask one one last thing. Uh, ask as many as you want. Uh, like um, when you start Electron applications, it's a bit sometimes a bit slow. Yes. Are there ways to improve that? Mm, 
Yes. I saw like online and I saw like the V8 contexts. Yes, uh, either you use the context or sometimes uh, it, it, it very much depends on how big uh, the JS file that you load here is. Because basically when, when you load this thing, like the index.html file, basically it will have somewhere a script tag um, at the bottom. Uh, so the bundle and size has to be as small yes, so as possible. It's, it's good to have a very small size. Um, it's not very smart to do like code splitting or anything because uh, it won't save any space on uh, on the installer. It will still it will but still it will still be big, start but it's faster. good that that still in this case a code splitting would help to show only for the first paint. What no. some sometimes certain people do in case you want a load speed is like in the index HTML you actually show. Uh, directly, uh, you put the markup yourself there. You don't mm -hmm. wait for the framework to load anything. Like you, you fetch in the background the script. Like you put it as a sync to load as a sync the the script, mm -hmm. and you have like a static markup to give like a skeleton or something, and then it will look like it loads very fast. No, no, I understand. That's. So the That's a basic is... trick that I would suggest. No, I understand. But then the you do say that the bottleneck is actually the the yes content yeah. application. Uh, yes, because uh, the thing is, it's you see, it's it's a bit sequential because the first thing when you start Electron, it starts the main process, so the node process, and then it does n things, and then it says load this. And then it loads whatever it's in there, but it's not like when you go to the browser and you load the application. Before that, you saw a white screen and now you still see a white screen because mm -hmm. it still tries to parse JavaScript and a huge file. So that's where I would say uh, requires a, a bit of playing with it. You can also play with context but from my experience, it's it's very tedious. I, I did that, and mm -hmm. yes, it, it loads faster, but I I wouldn't say it was worth the work. No. Okay. Thanks. Very informative. You're welcome. So if. All right. No, I think if. Uh... If those are all of the questions, then I want to give a, a big thank you and shout out to Danut. Thank you for uh, for giving us all some more information about Electron, for putting together the presentation and the demo. Um, like Danut already said, he, he, um, he made a PDF of, of all of the slides that I can share with you all. We did a recording of the session as well. Um, he has a link to the to the demo as well, so you can all look over it um, afterwards to see um, to see everything again and then maybe connect with Danund if you have any more questions regarding Electron uh, or, or am I being too forward now, Danund? Um, no, it's okay. I'm happy to answer. As much, saba, as, saba, saba. as, much right. as I know to answer, I, I would happily try to answer. Nice. Sounds really good. But no, thank you all for, uh, for spending your evening with us. Um, and again, a big thank you to Danut for um, for all of the information. And uh, let's hope we can see each other soon in an, uh, in another talk or another webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.